All right. Well, how about if we get started? There's a lot of exciting stuff to go through today. So uh, welcome to those who are virtually gathering and uh, great to see you and great to be with you here today. So let's pray. Father, thank you for the privilege of, of coming before you and, and looking at your word and thinking about this, this blessing of work that is also tarnished as part of the fall. Lord, help us to have uh, the right perspective and gain uh, wisdom in how to go about your work. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so I'd like to get started today with thinking about what is uh, an odd experience that you've had at work? <laughs> like just sort of one of those odd things that was strange. And, and try not to make it like a 15 minute story. I mean, try to try to pack Where it. Where are you looking at your feelings? <laughs> <laughs> I had this memory too. <laughs> uh, I'll throw out one just to kind of see it. Of, this isn't anything that crazy, but I was uh, preparing to do a funeral for, um, and it was with a family. I didn't really know them. And just before it started, and I was a little nervous and not sure how the dynamics were and everything was quiet. And uh, the county coroner came up to me and loudly asked me if I was interested in a job as assistant coroner with him. And then he went into graphic detail of what that job entailed very loudly while everyone's preparing. Awkward, right? I mean, that was one of those, how do I leave this situation? So that was odd. Did you take the job? Huh? No. As a matter of fact, uh, his, his graphic descriptions didn't fit my uh, career goals. <laughs> No one's had an odd experience, really. I have just a cute one from when I was teaching. I taught first graders for a long time, and one of the things you do in first grade is line up at the door, make sure everybody's quiet before you leave. And somehow we got talking about jobs, and the kids were talking about what their dads did. And one little red had looked up at me, and she said, what do you do for a job? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. I'm a mom here at school. <laughs> <laughs> I was the lead commissioner for the city of Melbourne. <laughs> wow. Mm. I might still be. Yeah. Uh, do you, you onliners? Do you do you have a story of uh, interesting work experience? I had a cringy experience. I was uh, shadowing a neurologist in an undisclosed location, and they had a patient who had a very new diagnosis of Parkinson's disease and had not, what um, had just a very minor tremor. And the doc trying to teach me in the room went into this very graphic enactment of end stage Parkinson's disease in front of the patient and his wife. And I was horrified as were the patient and his wife. And I just wanted it to stop. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's tough. Oh, Bob, you unmuted. You must have something to share. Back when I was in my 20s, one of the very first jobs I ever had was working in the glass fa a glass factory in Salem County, New Jersey. That was a completely new experience for me. It was a very loud experience. And I got to work with people of various uh, backgrounds, and it was quite a cultural uh, awakening experience for me as well. Yeah, yeah. So, so Bob's reaching back like five or ten years to when he was in his twenties, and uh, good, good. So we all have those interesting experiences that we can look back on, and, and to some degree, uh, some are heart wrenching, 
And some are just fruity, right? You look back and it's like, whoa, what were people, whoa, what was going on? Today, I want to move from fruity, those memories that come back quickly, to how do we deal with work that is fruitless? When it feels like we get to the end of a week and we say, what was this for again? And that's something that Keller gets into this time. And, and we're going to get into this by looking at uh, Genesis chapter three. So yeah, let's go to the slides. Genesis chapter three, verses 17 through 19. And this is uh, the, the curse directed to, to Adam. But of course, uh, all of us live under this. Um, and if, last time we went to uh, DJ Jim multiple times, and, and I'm afraid I'm going to have to offer a contract if he has to read every time this time. Is there, is there someone else to be willing to read verses 17 through 19? Sure. Thank you. And to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat it. Curse is the crown because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth you. And you shall eat the plants of the field. But sweat of your face you shall eat bread. Till you return to the ground, for out of you it you were taken, for you were dust. From the dust you shall return. All right. Thank you. So last week we focused on how work is a blessing. It was, it was created before the fall. And now we get a picture of the tarnishing of, of work. And it talks about thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, which of course, in, uh, in contrast to the garden, that there's definitely a very literal piece to that. But figuratively, what are thorns and thistles that you experience at work today? Working third shift. Yes, yes, third shift. Oh, oh. Busy coworkers. Oh, yeah. Lazy coworkers. Yeah, especially in a team environment. That is, that is not fun. Things that management decided to do. Mmm. Yes. Oh, deadlines. Sales quotas. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now let's twist this question a little bit. Have you ever been a thorn at work? <laughs> I'm more rose than thorn, personally. Yeah. <laughs> now, how can we end up to be a thorn at work? Sometimes you don't know what your job is. You're unconsciously incompetent. Mm. You may not be deliberately be the horn, but you might well be thorn because either you didn't listen or you had a totally different concept that you believe was right for no one bothered to teach you or any guidance. Yes. Yes. You stick to your guns and, and don't go along with the flow and you disagree with something. Mm. Charge. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You add to the gossip and backbiting. Yeah. It is. It's interesting how easy it is to be part of 
an untamed garden of, of, of to become part of the thorns and thistles. Going back to the passage and thinking about thorns and thistles in a little bit broader, what do we learn about work from this passage? It's going to be tough. Yes. It's going to be tough. Work is part of the fall. It's tarnished by the fall. Since you shall not eat of it, so sometimes we won't um, get the produce, we won't get the harvest, we will work, but we won't see that end result. Mm, kind of that fruitless idea. There'll be, there'll be times of fruitlessness. In the garden, readily available was everything they needed to eat. Mm. And, and now it is the sweat of your face that will bring you the bread that you eat. Yes. That will be given to you. So that's a, that's a fact and it's an expectation that we all should work or have to work. Mm. For our bread. Yes. It doesn't stop till you're dead. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not always bad. My dad used to quote uh, saying, work makes life sweet. Mm hmm. And so that is a very important distinction that this passage still holds for us. Work is affected by the curse, but work itself is not a curse. This passage doesn't say all work is bad. It says it's going to be hard. There will be times of fruitlessness. However, you're still going to be able to eat at least some of the days. There's still the opportunity to take in some of the bounty of what is done. So there's a sense that all is not lost when it comes to work. We talked about that some last week of, with, the, with the Christian perspective on work. It, it's not this awful thing to be avoided. It's actually a good thing, but that's tarnished. Let's go to the next slide. And this is um, one of the quotes from Keller. But even during times when you are satisfied with the quality of your work, you may be bitterly disappointed with the results. You may find that circumstances conspire to neutralize any real impact from your project. Can you relate to that quote? More than I would like to. <laughs> yeah. I haven't experienced it myself, but there are times when <clears throat> when a group within a company has been working on a project for sometimes for years and that area now functions under that and somebody new comes in and they do not make an effort to understand all the work that went into that. Mm. And they they will go in a different direction, throw away mm. all of that work, mm. which is disconcerting to those who have done it and yes. enjoy living under it. Yes. Yeah. Pastor Liz, you were starting to share something also. Yeah, and I think in the church context, we often, um, and Nate and I compare notes, and sometimes we don't immediately experience the results that we expected. Uh, and that can be very challenging because the results may be a decade or more in the future. But, but yet, uh, we do reap what we sow. And sometimes, what we reap may actually be a little different than what we thought we sowed. Yeah. Yeah. You think about a number of, you know, going to like inventions type of things. How many were accidents of post-it notes? I love post-it notes, mm -hmm. you know, and, and 
you know, that, that wasn't what was being sought after. Somebody didn't think, oh, I'm going to come up with this great post-it note thing. Uh, it's all those things that uh, are a little bit different than maybe what the intentions were. Well, like Edison with the light bulb, how many time different filaments did he try before he found one that actually worked well? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I also think the space technology, that, that's a really visual one that everybody can remember, like some of those failed efforts at sending um, spaceship stuff and how much work went into that, and they are so precise, and but it's a moment failed. Goodbye. Yeah. And yet we got Tang. <laughs> yeah, if, if, if you think about the number of, of sci maybe Tang is uh, high on everybody's <laughs> list, but you, you think of the number of things that came out of the research for, of, of space exploration. Amazing, just amazing. And Keller talks about extremes that we can have. Am I going to split you two up? I just want to know how you know about Tang, but not the Weltons. <laughs> 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 okay, oh, yes. oh, oh, okay. okay, so uh, <laughs> obscure, nasty tasting beverages. I'm an expert. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Sorry, didn't mean to distract. <laughs> no, you're right on. You're right on. That, that, that's true. That's true. Because I, I watched the Walton while I was drinking tanks. <laughs> <laughs> so Keller talks about the extremes of idealism and cynicism when it comes to dealing with fruitlessness of work. You can go to idealism in which I'm going to change the world. You know, everything I do, I'm going to change the world. And then there's the opposite side of cynicism, which is nothing's going to change. So I'm not going to let myself care. Which way do you tend to sway? Are you an idealist of, I think I can change the world, or more of a cynic of, I'm not going to let myself get disappointed? Depends on which side of the bed I wake up on. Because <laughs> on some days, because I, I, everyone who's here doing, doing these large corporate things, and I'm like, there are days that I plan for my kids and for us, and we're gonna we're gonna go out, we're gonna have an adventure, and I have a lunch pack, and it's gonna be great. And then it's pouring rain, or my kids are screaming the entire time, or they won't put their expletive to shoes on, and <laughs> and. Like I'm not, I'm not going to lose it. I'm not going to lose it. Just put your shoes on. And, and it, you know, there are days like, well, I'm not going to let that happen. That's not going to happen. And then there's days like, I don't care if you destroy the house. I'm not doing anything today. Fine. Just go. Just, yes, go outside and just run Pharaoh all day because I don't care. So yes to both. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it's, I mean, that, that's like human resources at, at its highest level of, you know, in, in terms of uh, investing in kids, that is like the longest span human re resource development possible. And oh, swinging between cynicism and idealism, that's huge. And some days you start idealistic and then you end in cynicism. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the thorns and thistles can grow quite quickly. Yeah. I think for me, the, ba the balance comes in realizing that our work is is kind of pointless you know there's nothing new under the sun we're just trying to keep alive and are in the grand scheme of things our work no matter how big it looks isn't but when we see god working and that we have a little part in that to me, that puts it all in perspective. Yes. Yeah. Let, let's let's go to the next slide. Oh, you before we do that, I just have to point out to everyone online and here, there is a photo credit here at the bottom. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Thank you for the nice picture. Are there more? Yes. Uh, there, yeah, there's there, I, good. 
I didn't give him photo credit coming up, but there is another photo of it that I believe is Sam. You'll have to verify whether or not it's his. I couldn't, I couldn't honestly remember. Uh, <clears throat> just before uh, Pastor Paul read the curse of Adam, and just before that is, is the curse of the serpent. Some refer to this as proto Galion. The earliest sharing of the kernel of the gospel in scripture. Ooh. I will put enmity between you, serpent, and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Speaking of Eve, offspring singular points to the idea of there will be coming a time in which there will be a singular individual, Jesus Christ, who will bruise the head of the serpent, and the serpent will bruise his heel. I don't know how many of you watched, oh, what was that? Oh, no. What was that Jesus movie? Um, well, no, no, yeah, 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 yeah. They have those guys in the Waltons. Um, Jesus' crucifixion. The Passion. The Passion. There's a garden scene. I think it was Garden of Gethsemane, maybe. They threw this in briefly, in which Jesus steps on a snake. Just a taste of, of this idea. So I'm, I'm bringing this up. This is an interesting discussion to have. Of, is this an early kernel of the gospel message? It's at least a foreshadowing of the gospel message. And the reason I bring this up is even amidst the curse that's taking place, God is saying, I am at work in this world. I am at work redeeming this situation. And so when we think about work, it's important for us not to just think about what am I doing? What's the fruit of my participation? But to remember, God is at work. And to see how, on the grand scheme, things are taking place for his glory. And so I just wanted to throw this in to keep our frame of reference to not only be about me, because if we're, if we're doing a theology, it's not supposed to be uh, human centric. You know, it's not all about me. It's about God. And remember, God is at work. And he is at work redeeming. Um, let's, let's go on to the next slide. This is uh, a chart done by uh, Amy Sherman. Uh, she wrote the book Kingdom Calling. And she has an interesting perspective of there's different places that we invest our work. There's Bloom, what we do kind of in our daily work that we do, whether that is uh, at, a, uh, at a job, whether it is uh, in our home, whether it is it's where we invest daily. Then she talks about donating, where you volunteer in different places, inventing, where you create an organization that you work through, and investing in which you invest maybe in a, a church's uh, activity. I just wanted to throw this in as a reminder to us that as we think about work, that we don't just think about our vocational work. We don't just think about the work that we do at church. There's work that we do at home. There's work that we do in civic organizations. There's work that we do in our communities. And to think about the different ways that we should be looking to join God in his work. Last week, we talked about that it's easy to fall into the secular sacred divide of, you know, this is this is just what I do so I can make money to live. And then I'll invest the rest of my time in God's stuff. It's all together. And so it's important to see where, where God is at work. Let's go ahead to the next one. 
And this is uh, obviously not the same quality as the other picture. This was taken with my cell phone. So um, that, that, that's the quality there. Staircase of disappointment. Of, we started talking about fruitlessness. Keller goes on to say, yeah, we started fruitless, but then work even seems pointless. You know, not just, are there any results? Then it's everything that I'm doing, what's the point? Why did I do what I did today? And then we end up focusing on ourselves and into this selfishness uh, sort of situation. And to think about pointless, we're going to look at Ecclesiastes. And so let's, let's read this verse. We can go into the slide of this verse. And after we read this verse, let's, let's stop sharing because I want to see the people who are virtually with us because I, I, I know that they can just leave their screen and, and no one knows. So this way we can, we can be part of uh, all together again. And I'm giving you four warnings so you can um, yeah, be back. Yeah. All right. If someone would, would read this passage, that would be great. All right, so remember this, toiling beneath the sun, full of sorrow, work is vexation. All right, so let's hold on to this great, wonderful picture of work that's offered here. And so, yeah, let's, let's go ahead and um, stop the screen share for a little bit, and we'll, we'll kind of be together as a group. As a reminder, in Ecclesiastes, there, there's a walk through uh, looking for meaning in life. The, the author or speaker talks about learning and wisdom. And they say, I didn't find any meaning in that. And then they talk about uh, focusing on pleasure. They said, I didn't find meaning there. And then I turned to hard work. And this is where the author said, I didn't find meaning in hard work alone and talks about this idea of toiling under the sun. The idea that I didn't find meaningful things in this life through hard work. So kind of given that passage and, and thinking through the authors walking through not finding meaning, what does this tell us about work? Yeah, so maybe, maybe maybe explain that a little bit. Well, your, your purpose is not to work. But by working, you can discover things. Mm. So my, my purpose in my life is not the work that I do. My purpose in my life is to bring glory to God. And one of the ways that I bring glory to God is by working. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I saw some head nodding with that. That seems to be some agreement there. I don't think I was taking it that most of the time when I was working. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I was just working. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know, it didn't mind working. I didn't like working. Mm. I wasn't there. Yeah. And, you know, when, when we think about, am I making a difference? Is, is this having an impact? It can be setting us up for disappointment, right? Um, um, I have now worked enough years that I, I realized probably the world is not going to be changed because of Carl Green's work, right? I mean, you know, we, we get to the point of kind of realizing um, there's not going to be that dramatic impact by my life directly. It's like Abraham Lincoln said, 
the world will little note nor long remember. Mmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's part of the important uh, process of humbling that we all need. Yeah. Um, and yeah. Then, then God can use us once we're humble. Yes. The, the perspective of what is, what is my role uh, what is God's role? Yeah, very much so. I'd like to read you another quote from Keller that I thought is quite interesting. One of the reasons so many people find work to be unsatisfying is ironically that people today have more power to choose their line of work than did people in the past. And he cites a New York Times article. There's, there's also some, uh, there's a book out there, The Paradox of Choice, and, and some other things that brings out this idea of we're overwhelmed by choices today. That on the one hand seems like, oh, that's so wonderful. But Keller is saying, actually, it messes with our perspective. Kind of going along with what Winnie was saying of humility, we actually start thinking, well, if I choose the right career, I will change the world. If I choose the right pathway, I'm going to do all these things for God. In, in which we get our perspective off. So do you think that this is a thing? That, does this make it harder? Like if you think uh, 200 years ago, in which if your dad was a farmer, most likely you would be a farmer. If, if, um, if you were in a family that uh, had a, a certain mercantile business, that would be your business. You didn't think a lot about what you were going to do. Do you think choice actually is an issue today? Did I choose the right to do? Yeah. It's our push to choices, college selections, career, but I know that people could look more at the schools that I do, but career education is really pushing on. Yeah. Yeah. And, well, I mean, there's a hierarchy of careers. There's good careers that you want to strive for, and then, well, if you're not good enough for those, then you can fall back on these other ones which aren't so good. And I, I disagree with that. Yeah. And, and Keller speaks very aggressively against that. Of That's an indication that um, we're not looking at work through God's design of work. And I still remember my uh, high school guidance counselor when I told her that I wanted to uh, be a farmer. She said, you're too smart for that. <laughs> do not do that. And these are colleges you should apply to. <laughs> you know, just that very, that very much uh, sharp edge of there are career types that are good and there are career types that those people get stuck with. And you know, and Oh, go ahead. I was going to say that shows how much she did not know about farming because dumb farmers don't get very far. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And last week we talked a little bit about um, calling and Oz Gisnet, Oz Gisnet, Guinness, Guinness, Gizzard, Oz Guinness. <laughs> There's two of those books upstairs for free, by the way, that are extra copies. So if you're interested in that book, uh, they're up in the uh, Welcome Center. Um, he talks about when we get so focused on calling, we can get elevating certain jobs and devaluing certain jobs and almost have a conceit 
of, well, I'm gifted in this way. And so therefore God's going to use me in this dramatic way. We get conceited about how God has wired us rather than truly living out a calling. Okay, let's let's um let's go back to does anyone well before we go back to screen sharing, um anyone anyone online with us have anything they want to throw in at this point? I think God toys with us. Um, I I spent about twenty years with Mercy Health System and human resources capacity. Phenomenal organization, and I always told people it was the beauty of the beast at the same time. Hmm. Phenomenal opportunities to develop, work, those kinds of things. But it would be crazy if it was also like any large bureaucracy. I can remember days sitting in my office going, what am I doing here in this crazy pit? Mm. Then, bam, or someone I need to come to for help. And I'm not going to don't pretend to be clinical. I have to learn some things along the way. So you talk the language, but you know how to navigate the bureaucracy. Mm. You can provide comfort and direction. And that happened to me over and over again. And I thought, um, gee, God, I didn't know what you were doing. Mm. Yeah, so that, that speaks back to Genesis chapter 3, in which it, it's still left there that we will have a taste of fruit of labor at times. We, we will have a taste of the goodness that God is bringing about through our efforts. And then that can give you great energy and stamina and hopes to carry on. Yeah. And maybe yeah. broaden your whole aspect of what you're doing. Yeah. And so that brings us to needing to find a balance. And um, Bob, you're unmuted. Did you have something you wanted to say? As, as I'm listening to the class, I'm learning a lot from this class. I appreciate it. And, and you were talking earlier about farming and, and generation to generation. And I think back to how uh, my mother's parents were farmers in Cumberland County, New Jersey. But my mother and several of her sisters and one of her brothers eventually got into the field of education and became public school teaching school teachers and several of my first cousins became public school teachers and and now uh cousins of mine who are second and third cousins they are involved in public teaching and a lot of these schools where they have taught for decades different generations of my family have all been in cumberland county new jersey and, and I'm listening to this, and I find this very interesting, and, and I just wanted to share, in, in my life, I learned a lot in the classroom, in my education, college, and seminary, but I also lear learned a lot in my work classroom, whether it was pastoring a church or working with developmentally disabled people. Life experiences have taught me so much. And I, and I really appreciated the quote uh, from uh, every good endeavor that you shared just a, a little while ago. Very meaningful to me, and I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Bob. And, and thank you for bringing out that idea of remembering that lessons are taught and lessons are caught. You know, there's, there's multiple ways that we learn. And so bringing that out is important. So, um, Bob Harris, he is, oh, okay. yeah, yeah, uh, as far as Wisconsin goes, served as pastor in Albion uh, for a period of time, and Bob is now out in Colorado, and uh, he'll be joining, he wasn't able to join us last week, but he'll be joining us uh, for a few of these classes, and yeah, let's, let's keep going, Carl, just toward this generational thing. 
my family. I grew up on a farm. Yes. My dad was a farmer. He was also a family for his high school class. But he told my brother and I growing up, don't go into this line of work. Huh. He said small farms are not going to be around in the future. So do something else. Mm. He just he just didn't now see a future for the small type of family farm that we had. And he encouraged us to do something else. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, I, I think, an indication of uh, a shift in opportunities mm -hmm. in, in which you, your dad saw that there's multiple opportunities. It's not just this is it in, in life and saying, yeah, look, look around. That's good. Thank you for mentioning that. And obviously, uh, Jim's a good guy because he grew up on a farm. So um, <laughs> This is something that uh, my friend Don Graffius shared with me, in which, you know, when we think about our work life, of balancing work life, is trying to find that hard work and proper rest balance. We can go to laziness, and we can also go to working too hard or, or being a workaholic. You know, John was mentioning how we get times where we get that taste of fruit, or or maybe we get into times where we're idealists and you know, our family can be a perfect family if I just invest enough in them. And, and, and we can tilt towards working too hard and just focusing that. And the way that um, Keller worded it was, we can make idols of comfort and pleasure and lean towards laziness, or we can make idols of power and approval and overwork. How have you kept this balance in life? And again, this is work. This isn't, this is, we detangled job and work in which we're, we're looking at the broad element of work where we work in our household, we work um, with our family, we work at uh, church functions, we work at civic functions, we work uh, sometimes in paid vocations. How do you find the balance with work, or how have you found the balance with work? Sabbath is the obvious one of taking a day of rest and not getting the phone to work. Hmm. <laughs> well, I couldn't hear you, I'm sorry. One piece will be watching the difficult things to do. So yeah yeah there's a there's an emotional intelligence that that we have of observing what's going on around us and, and being able to read that yeah the difficult part about that though is oftentimes people on the right side of that um, scale don't, don't recognize that because I think if they did they would think that and so because they're so busy working I was raised by a father that would fall on that side of the scale that they don't recognize it because they're just so darn busy working so hard to try to prove something. Um, and so I totally agree with you. Um, and even sometimes when you try to point it out to them, it doesn't sink in. Yeah. Yeah. My father would so focused and so successful and you know, got all these accomplishments along with two bleeding ulcers and a heart attack, you know, the job mm -hmm. almost killed him. So I, I swung the other way, just try to be more well-rounded, get into all different activities and try to not be so focused and, and in, in a way it helped me, but I also I felt bad for him. <laughs> that yeah. Just that he was so driven. And then skip the generation, my son, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> but it's you know it's funny how 
in the tank that the person doesn't see it in the hotel. The, I mean, it's had this really, I've had many hard to conversations with my father um, lately for many different reasons, but um, I remember one very specific one recently where I said to him, you know, Dad, what are you, what are you trying to prove? Yeah. Like, are you trying to prove? And his comment to me was, I, I said, are you trying to prove something to us for children? Mm. Like that you have to prove something to us. And he said, no, I'm trying to prove to myself that I'm not useless. Yeah. And I, then the conversation <laughs> turned to this really, um, I said, you know, I think that's really probably very saddening to God to hear that. Mm -hmm. Um. But that's really where it was all about. It's like he's still at the age of 85 trying to prove something. And I don't, I'm not, you know, criticizing my father. I'm just putting out the reality of it. And um, it, it saddens me because I don't, there isn't anything I can say to him or that will, because I've tried it yeah. <laughs> many times. Yeah. Um, that will get him to see past that. Mm. So it's, it's really um, it's sad. Yeah, yeah. I understand that I'm on his age and it's really old. What am I now? Yeah, in Keller's book, he talks about that. That um, you know, are we trying to still work for our salvation? Kind of Martin Luther's, you know all this writings and problems with the church were, you know, it's not by works, it's by grace. And but that's a human tendency that I think is so easy to fall into. Like we've got to earn God's, you know, whether we recognize that or not, earn God's um, works. So. Yeah. Yeah. And then I, I like how Keller kind of leads into the space of idol making. Of we take this good thing, and like with this, we can make an idol of either side. We can make an idol of uh, developing our identity based on hard work or, or fruit of work, or we can focus on our identity of uh, leisure, our identity of um, not falling into that same trap. And our identity is somewhere in between. And um, before we go to the next slide, I, I want to mention of something that was significant for me of, of detangling of, I, I, I am a workaholic, that's something I struggle with. And, uh, you know, you, you, it's a cool thing to think through your life there now. So uh, thinking back through my own, going back to the farm again, so I can connect with Jim. Uh, when I was 16, my grandparents gave me a car and one of my coworkers, was asking about that, and I, I told him, and he said, it must be nice to be born with a silver spoon in your mouth. <laughs> silver car. <carnival. laughs> right. It was a Chevy celebrity, right? I mean, it was, it was but instead of me focusing on, wow, what a blessing for my grandparents this is amazing. I was embarrassed that I was given something, and my family's narrative is, we work hard for everything we got. And so from that point on, I was going to work the most hours. I was going to work holidays. I was going to prove that I did not have a silver spoon in my mouth, which is ridiculous. I did. You know, I mean, <laughs> let, let, let's be honest. I mean, that, that was a blessing. But in, in, in thinking about what, what Mike was saying about, you know, when some of us get stuck on proving ourselves, I got stuck on proving myself. And it didn't just stop at 16-year-old Carl. It's like this recurring thing of, if there's insecurities, it's, well, I can prove myself if I just work a little harder. If, you know, and it's just interesting of how we can get stuck in those places. Kind of coming back to Whitney's statement about needing to be humble and, and recognizing God is the one who gives us our identity. And, and Carol, when we're talking about spiritual healing, um, you know, a question often asked is what vows did you make? You know, like praying for God to release that um, um, vow that we made with um, the evil one, really, like 
you know, here I vowed that I would prove myself in this, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. and there's a spiritual aspect of it that gets totally twisted because we want to prove ourselves or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that the, the tricky thing too, Carl, you, you know, as you have kids and um, is you, you raise children in that environment and that's what they see growing up and they, because that's what you, I mean, any, those of us who've been in teaching, um, we, we understand kids because when that, that's their normalcy, any, anything, any normalcy that a child grows up in, that's what they think is normal because that's what they see. And so all four of us kids in my family, my three sisters and I all have a tendency to scale to the right side of that because that's what we saw growing up. Mm -hmm. And so it's a constant battle to, um, to acknowledge that and then to confess it. Yeah. And then to work to change it through that grace. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's the, the, the tricky thing is we pass that on from generation to generation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It can be a hard thing to break. I want to go back way to the beginning that you know we're we are called to, to change the world. Mm. But in humility, that world is is small. The world is our family. We're mm. called to change our family. We're called to change those we work with, we're called to change those who benefit from our work or employment or product. You know, it's, we are changing the world, but be humble enough to realize that it's it's a small sphere, mm. but we are called to, to make changes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's good. Let's let's go ahead to the. I hate this is a great conversation, but I've got more, and we only have a few minutes left. Um, so, with we we know the, the the ten commandments, and we're told not to have idols. Keller talks about how we have individual idols and we have group idols. So when it comes to individual idols, we, we can come up with those, right? You know, power, money, prestige, uh, those things. What are group idols? If we take, if we take this passage into mind, what, what would a group idol be? Uh, patriotism. So, so uh, unchecked patriotism can can become. Um, you know, that's easier for us to look at other countries, right? Where 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 patriotism went amok and, and weird things happen. But if we're honest, patriotism unchecked in our own culture leads to odd things. Yes. Right now, there's an idol of health and safety. Yeah, yeah. We're we're a safety net culture, or a seatbelt culture. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't use those things, but but we're so focused on uh, safety that um, any risk is seen as a as a terrible thing. Ellen? And the the goal that it can be it can be used to other people that trying to be in control of of that the trying to be in control of people with with that and other things. And yeah, just trying to keep the way. Control yeah, yeah, yeah. There ends up kind of a group think sort of sort of situation and uh, controlling pieces. Yeah, that's good. I think our culture has kind of two uh, the two extremes of that prior picture. Uh, you've got like the Instagram relaxation laziness kind of idle and then the um oh i'm always so busy uh and working so hard i think it's a little bipolar our culture yeah 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 i, I recently read a book in which it was um a decade ago it was cool to say some astronomically high number of hours that you worked every week 
And now it's increasingly becoming cool to brag about how many hours of sleep you're able to get because it demonstrates that you have arrived somehow and, and that there's a culture, but, but kind of brings out that idea of, boy, it swings both ways of depending on who you're with of, oh, this is how much I work, I'm amazing. Or, boy, I, I've got my life under control so much I can be rested this much. I got a solid eight hours of sleep yeah. last night, two nights in a row. <laughs> Um, where, where I'd like to end, um, with the next slide, oh. that, that's a oh. Sam picture <laughs> and, wow. and we don't have time to talk about that chicken. So we'll have to go on. Uh, yeah. Next slide. Yeah, this is not really it's entertaining. Uh, All right. <laughs> H. Richard Niebuhr. This is a great way to end it. So, He's you know, a good writer. yes, I had dreams of being a theologian at one point, but I realized I could not get that face. <laughs> <laughs> so next slide, 70 years ago, he wrote this Christ and culture. And go ahead and click it one more time. And he talked about how uh, we can see over time where people looked at Christ against culture, Christ of culture, Christ above culture, all these different ways that, that Christ engages with, with culture. And I'm, I'm going to boil it down quickly. One more slide. We have the idea that there are times in which God calls us to separate from the culture around us, that things are just in a place in which it is not godly at all, and we need to separate ourselves. We can turn to James to, to see places like that. We can also see places where we conform more to the culture. We can look at a passage in Revelation that, that gives a glimpse of that. And there's also times in which we're called to directly engage with our culture. And, and that is more of, of looking to transform the, the culture that there's elements of, of good that, that can be brought about for better. When it comes to work, part of being work being tarnished in the fall is that there are times in which we are called to separate from elements of the work, of, of being very distinct in the choices that we make. There's also times in which it might not be an overtly Christian thing, but there are some amazing things that are taking place in uh, uh, in, in work, whether it's a community thing or in our family or, or vocationally, and we can just join in that, not, not necessarily look to give it the Christian veneer, but to just celebrate that this is a good thing, like a care, caring sort of thing. And then there's times in which we are called to bring about change. Now, I wanted to end with this because when we think about fruitlessness, pointlessness, selfishness, even idolatry of work, I think it's important for us to remember that when with work, there's different roles that we're called to do. We're not necessarily always called to simply go with the flow. We're also not always called to be the stick in the mud. There are times where, where we are. And there's times in which we're to engage and bring about transformation. And I think when we think about fruitfulness, it's important to think about well, what's God's call for me in my role right now. So let, let's go one more. Uh, this is a photo by my niece, Katie. Um, what motivates you to work? You should really say what motivates you. Oh! oh. 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 Just saying. <laughs> so, uh, with oh, that said, <laughs> I'm not teaching next week. <laughs> next, next, next week will be nine arts as a reminder. Where we're going to have a nine arts refresher next week. So, um, what motivates you to work? <laughs> oh, <laughs> I heard <laughs> uh, We are slightly over time. I, I want you to, I, I want all of us to wrestle with this some. After going through this pointless, fruitless conversation, what are, what are godly motivations that we have for work? 
in which we really do make a difference. Going back to what Kevin was saying of, um, you know, we are called to make a difference close to us and, and, and different rings going out through our relationships. What motivates us? Is it selfish or is it to honor and glorify God? And what does that look like? So with, with that, let's, uh, Pastor Liz, would you close us in prayer? All right. Father, I want to thank you so much for giving us the, the pleasure and the challenge of working. I thank you for uh, what Carl has shared with us today, and I pray that this will enrich our week and our lives. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. In two weeks, we will um, we will look at the gospel and work, and uh, for those of you who are reading and want to focus, it's it will be chapters 10 and 12 is what we'll focus on, but it'll be section three of the book.